The governments of South Africa, France, Germany and the United Kingdom and the United States of America, along with uh, a number of European Union countries, announced a long-term Just Energy Transition Partnership to support South Africa's decarbonisation efforts. Now, this will see the mobilisation of an initial commitment of $8.5 billion dollars for the first phase of financing aimed at accelerating the decarbonisation of South Africa's economy. And this with a focus on the electricity system to help it achieve the ambitious goals that it set out in its updated National Determined Contribution or NDC emissions goals. I spoke to the UK government's envoy, Dr John Merton, about the new partnership and what it would mean for South Africa. Dr. John Merton, UK Government's COP26 Envoy. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Welcome to you. Thank you very much for having me on. Let's begin with uh, this International Just Energy Trust, uh, a transition partnership with South Africa. Just how groundbreaking is it? I think it's a, it's a really innovative partnership because for the first time it brings together um, a lot of the major uh, donor community countries like the UK, the US, the EU, France and Germany. And it brings them together with a country like South Africa that set out a very clear climate ambition. And uh, we're seeking now to work together with the South African government to help you deliver on your climate goals. So in that sense, it's a model for other countries to take forward. You were in South Africa recently. Uh, how did the discussions go? I know you were part of uh, quite a uh, sizable delegation of a number of countries. What did you learn? Well, what we learned was there's huge commitment in South Africa, uh, not just to, to tackle climate change, that's, that's clear through your, your climate commitments uh, that have been made recently, but also to make sure that it's done in a way that supports those communities that might um, might be disadvantaged as a result of the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and what we're seeking to do with the South African government is work together in a partnership that enables the government in Pretoria to, to deliver on its climate goals, but do so in a way that enables us to not only support those communities uh, that might um, be affected by those transitions, but also to maximize the opportunities in South Africa to deliver power, to, to, to grow the economy and to create jobs. Tell us a little bit more about just transition. A lot of our viewers hear this term. Um, what does it mean, particularly in a country like South Africa? So um, in a country like South Africa, you, well, in South Africa, you have the most carbon intensive energy generation system in the world. The population of South Africa is smaller than the population of the UK uh, and the economy is smaller, but your, your greenhouse gas emissions are higher than the UK. So South Africa is a significant uh, emitter of greenhouse gases, the highest in Africa. Um, and we want to work with the South African government to deliver on their, their climate goals, um, but to support those communities that are affected. Now, I'm Welsh and I come from an area that historically has had a lot of mining communities and played a lot of rugby. It didn't help us much uh, this weekend against uh, the South African team, but we'll ignore that for a moment. But in Wales, we had a transition away from, from coal production uh, through the 1980s that was, was painful for, for many of the communities concerned. So what we want to do is work with the South African government to not only ensure that um, ESCOM and other generators um, in the South African energy market can provide the energy, the electricity that your economy needs to drive growth and create jobs, but also to support those communities who work in coal mining, who work in the power generation sector, um, particularly in areas like Mpumalanga, and support them to transition to alternate um, livelihoods. So I was able to go to Kamati Power Station uh, while I was in South Africa and saw, for example, the way they're seeking to transition uh, the Kamati site and use it for the fabrication of, of solar panels and solar installations that can be deployed, not just in rural areas of South Africa, but beyond in, into the wider African continent. So there's a, an initial commitment of about eight and a half billion dollars uh, for the uh, first phase of financing. Um, where will these funds come from and how will it work? So um, some of these funds will come from the Accelerating Coal Transition Fund of the World Bank's Climate Investment Funds. And those are highly concessional funds that would not usually be available to a middle income country like South Africa that will enable us to, to work very closely with the South African government to deliver the goals that I've been speaking about. 
um, and the rest of the funds come from um, bilateral contributions from countries like my own, where we will enable the South African government to access finance at a rate that's much cheaper than they would be able to do usually in order to, to make the sort of investments that I've been describing. There's been questions raised about developed nations and their commitment to financing. How do we know that you're going to follow through with this? Well, we've all signed on the dotted line together and uh, the nature of the project will be basically essentially matching funds from, from, from partners with what with projects that South Africa wants to take forward. So it's very clear that if the funds aren't, come, um, aren't forthcoming, that the projects won't go forward. Uh, and equally, the projects can only go forward if, if there are the funds. So it'll be, it'll be very much based on, on, a, on a consensual process. What we're trying to do in, in taking forward this, this partnership is make it much easier for South Africa to access those funds rather than having to go around to each of the different donors in turn and negotiate with them individually. We're working together as a partnership to South Africa can go to the one place and access the funds it needs in order to deliver on its climate goals and in order to power the South African economy into the, the second half of the 21st century. South Africa, uh, largest carbon emitter on the continent and uh, perhaps rightly then being encouraged to, to make this uh, transition to greener economies. But what is the international community doing to, to deal with big hitters like, like China? I think what we'll see increasingly is recognition around the world that the low carbon economy that we're transitioning to is actually an opportunity for jobs and for growth. And so yes, China, as you mentioned, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, but it's also the largest investor in renewable energy. It's also the largest market for and producer of zero emission vehicles. So the Chinese economy, which is enormous, of course, is, is changing very rapidly and there are leading um, uh, if you look globally, the, so some of the leading investors in renewable energy, the leading investors in, in zero emission vehicle technology are in China. So I'm confident that actually there's that opportunity to grow that's coming from the low carbon transition. You just have to look at global stock markets. Tesla is the most valuable automotive manufacturer in, a, in the world, and it's created thousands of jobs, but it didn't produce a single car before 2012. So we're seeing a very rapid change. Uh, and what's been really encouraging to see in, in South Africa, but also in many other countries around the world is, is industries realizing that if they want to remain competitive in the new global economy, they have to decarbonize their activities so that they, because um, carbon dioxide emission levels really matter to consumers. So to, if you need to be competitive, you need to decarbonize. And the South African government has recognized that. And I'd point you to what President Ramaphosa said in his statement to all South Africans recently about the just transition. He was really un underlining the fact that if South Africa wants to continue to compete in the global economy, it has to decarbonize its economy. And this partnership is about helping it to do that. So you're in Glasgow in Scotland right now. COP26 is underway. How is that going? Well, we're cautiously optimistic. Glasgow is not about renegotiating a new climate agreement. It's about demonstrating that the Paris Agreement works. And the Paris Agreement is about limiting the rising global temperatures to no more than two degrees centigrade and as close to 1.5 degrees C as possible. And some of the early external analysis uh, this week has shown that if actually, if countries make good and deliver on the commitments they've made, for example, like South Africa's ambitious NDC, then actually we stand a very good chance of limiting the rising global temperatures to 1.9, 1.8 degrees centigrade, which is a huge improvement from before Glasgow. Uh, it's not enough, we need to go further, but the signs are we're making progress. You talk about the, these nationally determined contributions, NDCs, and Paris, when the uh, uh, agreements were signed, it, at that time, I think everybody knew that uh, the commitments were not going to be enough. Um, and this uh, uh, Glasgow meeting, COP26, partly is to look at those NDCs and decide what to do next. I just wonder how are countries doing in revising uh, their NDC? We've seen a lot of ambitious revisions. South Africa's is a case in point. The UK has revised our NDC. We're now committed to a 68% reduction on our 1990 emission levels by 2030 and a 78% reduction on our 1990 emissions by 2035. So we're seeing more ambition 
from around the world. And that's partly possible because we've seen huge drops in the cost of things like solar power, in the cost of battery storage, in the cost of zero emission vehicles, in the cost of wind power. And that means that countries can afford to be more ambitious than they thought they could even just a few years ago. What we see now is that solar power is the cheapest form of electricity uh, that the world has ever known. And it's a perfect technology for getting out, not just across South Africa, but also across uh, African countries more widely. I was most recently our ambassador in the Re Democratic Republic of Congo. And green mini grid, solar power has huge potential to reach communities in rural areas that um, fossil fuels would, would never have managed. There is some criticism about COP26, though. There are some saying that um, there are a number of civil society groups and voices that are being excluded, and they are by and large um, watchdogs for some of the agreements that uh, you guys will be uh, agreeing to and signing. So we're seeking to make COP26 the most inclusive COP ever. I think what's remarkable is we are holding um, COP26 at all in the midst of a international COVID pandemic, you've seen many, many international summits cancelled. But we know that climate change is too important. Climate change won't wait for us to finish dealing with COVID-19. So we've we've put on COP26. We've had 120 world leaders here uh, last week. Uh, and yes, room capacities are slightly reduced because we have to enforce social distancing to, uh, to keep delegates safe and to keep the people of Glasgow safe. But we're aiming for the most inclusive COP ever because um, we need to hold countries to account for the commitments that they're making, just as you've described. Are you optimistic that there will be some kind of um, major movement after COP26? Because in the past, the COPs really, uh, by and large, haven't delivered as much as they should. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, I think what we see, and we see it on the streets of Glasgow uh, over the weekend with all the, the, the major protests that are there, is that increasingly climate change is an issue that voters around the world are concerned about. They're concerned about climate change, they're concerned about growth, and they're concerned about jobs. And the low transition to the low carbon economy that we're trying to support with this partnership with South Africa uh, helps to resolve all of those issues. Um, I've got a 17-year-old daughter and I'm a public servant and much of what I do is of little interest to her, but she is very concerned that we come home from Glasgow uh, with significant progress on climate change and we owe it to, to the children of the next generation uh, to ensure that they their livelihoods uh, are not fatally undermined by climate change and that we can support them in enjoying many of the, 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 the privileges that we enjoy today. What would you say then are some of the big wins so far at uh, COP26? I know one of them might be uh, that uh, public uh, financing of fossil fuels, fuels might be on the way out. So that I'd point you to a, a number of big wins. Uh, I'd point you to, for example, Vietnam, uh, an emerging economy of 110 million people. That's twice the population of South Africa on China's border that's just set a net zero 2050 target. I'd point you to Kenya, um, Africa's sixth largest economy that's also set a net zero 2050 target. And President Kenyatta has made clear that all of Kenya's power will come from renewable sources by 2030, which is a very ambitious um, target. And I'd point you, as you, you referred to, to the move in, in, in public and private finance away from fossil fuels. So um, this morning I was able to sign with the Netherlands as the 27th partner in a, in a coalition that's pledged to end all public international finance uh, for fossil fuels and ensure that it switches towards renewable energy to ensure a clean future. And also I'd point you to the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which now encompasses almost 40% of the wealth under management in the world and is targeted at ensuring that that wealth is invested in line with net zero goals. Dr. John Merton, the UK government's COP26 envoy, thank you so, so much indeed for joining us. And uh, we wish you the best and your colleagues there at uh, COP26 to deliver big. Thank you. And I look forward to coming back to South Africa to continue working with your government in this partnership. Thank you.